good time to go sit back and enjoy yourself. Man, that's the answer I want to give one day. That's it. Ain't managing shit on my money. Yep. <laughs> um, you know what? I want to ask you about a uh, very, very important movie in hip-hop history, especially one of my favorite hip-hop movies of all time. It came out in 84, uh, Crush Groove. How familiar are you with that movie, Lonzo? Fairly, com- fairly familiar, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Good, good. Because I want to know, you know, I-, I love the movie. I've seen it a thousand times. Um, from what you remember watching that movie at the first time, because it was 84, hip hop was in full force, pretty much on the East Coast and West Coast and everything. You know, they had the they had their Eve After Dark on the, on the East Coast in the movie. They had the business that was doing dirty with Homeboy that did uh, Run DMC and them dirty in the movie, blah, blah, blah. But was that movie pretty similar to what you guys were going through in 84 on the West Coast? Hell, hell no. Coast? It was nothing like what we were going through. Nothing. Nothing. It was I mean, East Coast and West Coast. The origins of West Coast and hip hop, West Coast and East Coast hip hop. Uh, only thing is, only thing is the same. We all use microphones. The diff- We all in 1984. The Eve was cracking. I'm about to move to Dudos. I I just dropped Slice. Uh, we still wearing hard sole shoes. Um, we still wearing slacks. Uh, we had a few people break dancing, but it wasn't, it still had not, it didn't take over. Pop, pop locking was the shit. Break dancing was cool, but that was something a lot of cats did other places, maybe at the Radio Tron, but not the Eve After Dark. Um, we had break dance contests. We had to clear the floor out because you couldn't do it on the stage. It just was a different vibe. I mean, I was the club owner, the record owner. So I wasn't going to do myself wrong. I mean, you know, from my perspective, and, and that's why I say West Coast and West Coast and East Coast hip hop, our origins, our stories are totally different. Everybody on the West Coast, everybody on the West Coast, in order to get a record deal, you had to start your own record company. Only person that did not start a record company was uh, Tidy T and I think Ice T. Everybody else, oh, well, then the second generation, like Cube, they he never had to start a record label, but um, LA Dream Team, World Class Record Crew, Unknown DJ, uh, DJ Flash, you know, Duffy, everybody was doing their own record, re- their own record companies. Uh, Jay King from uh, Timex Social Club, everybody started their own record companies. It was a, only a handful of guys that actually got started off and never had to have a record, uh, never had a record company. So we never, we never tried, we tried to get signed. Nobody was signing us in the beginning. Once we got popular, everybody wanted to sign us. We tried to sign this shit, didn't work out, and everybody ended up independent again. Okay. You know, I'm sure just from a music standpoint, you are rather familiar with Russell Simmons' career. Uh, were the beginning of Russell Simmons' career similar to what you were going through on the West Coast? No. Not at all. Starting the label, okay. I thought just the whole the whole starting well, the label thing, and I I didn't ha- I never had any partners. I've always been um, an independent player. Um, I had good team, unknown, um, Yella, and they was always a good team in the beginning. Uh, but I had my I had my own money because I had the Ebus the Dark. Um, I was a part I was a part of the group as well as the label owner. That was some unheard of shit. In fact, I'm the one. They gave everybody the idea to own their label and be in the group. Nobody was doing that before me. I mean, James Brown did when it came to hip hop. Uh, I'm like, dude, uh, excuse me, at the risk of sounding, sounding conceited, my ego was too big for me not to be in the goddamn group. Okay. I was not going to let y'all have all the goddamn fun. I enjoy taking care of business, but I can do that on Monday through Friday. I could hang out with y'all on the stage on Friday and Saturday. I never, I never really wanted to be a mainstream rapper, but I just, I enjoyed the fun, man. I've always did plays. I always did speaking. I always been, I was in dance groups as a kid. So the transition to being on stage as a rapper, doing whatever I had to do was, uh, was something I just, man, shit, are you crazy? I'm going to jump on the stage with you fools. Give me this guitar that ain't plugged up. I got this. Don't worry about it. Okay, That's funny, bro. <laughs> love it, love it. Yo, Unc, uh, Marlon Cozy wants to know, I remember you talking and describing Mr. Dootsie Williams and the beginning of Dudos. He had a relationship with the cast of Sanford and Son. Did he know Leroy and Skillet? 
Did he know him? He raised him. All these cats. Oh, all these down. dudes. Oh, <sighs> let me let me uh, say this. Let me calm down. There is a entertainment circuit called the Chitlin Circuit. The Chitlin Circuit at one time was a big, bigger part of LA as it was down south and in Texas. Down south, they had these little uh, homemade clubs or barns or whatever. Folks got together on Saturday night. They drank beer and hooch, whatever the case may be. LA is a little bit different. They, they put on them loud ass suits and, you know, they had the Chitlin Circuit. And the drinks be two dollars, and waitress be charging you two fifty. The nigga knew it. The nigga get mad about that fifty cent back then. Um, all these people would be around the Chitlin Circuit in L.A. and do du- and Ducey Williams would record them all. He made sure he made sure that these guys were on his label. He had the first comedy label, Laugh Records. He had Laugh Records. He had Dutone Record. Dutone Records was his music label, and Laugh Records was his comedy label. And he was killing Big Six because he had Dudo's Music Center. So we have comedy and his music act perform at his own venue. So he was killing it. He was selling records and he was selling tickets. And that was my dude because he, he he gave me my blueprint to do what I was doing. So yes, he knew all of them cats. He, he had he had uh, Red Fox signed to his label. He had um, uh, Pig Meat Markham. He had all of them, Skill- Skillet and Leroy. He had um uh he had um man he had everybody I can't think of look up laugh records okay and look at Sanford and Son um Lawanda Scott uh Lawanda Page all of them was on his label they'd all be a dudos all of them before Sanford and Son uh that's so cool I'm nerding out over here and I know oh, everyone I, in the all do- chat is as well us all do those did was grab or oh, was all of Fred when, when Red when Fred when Red Fox got his break for Sanford and son he just grabbed all his homies from the clubs that's how everybody got their job including my good buddy rest his soul uh Rollo okay they was all buddies Rollo used to, Rollo used to teach a uh, acting class off of 54th and Crenshaw I stayed one of his daughters and me and him got super cool before he passed, man. That was my dude. And he was the coolest cat on Sanford and Son to me. And he wore his own clothes, just so y'all know the little, little history. But yeah, all them cats, they all played the same club. Um, 20 Grand, uh, Imperial West. I mean, they had so many clubs in LA back in the 60s and 70s. It was ridiculous. Everybody had a club. Everybody. Damn. Did you ever get to see Fred Sanford live on stage? I saw him in, uh, I saw him in Vegas. Okay. I saw I saw um um Red Fox live in Vegas. Yep, sure did. 